I can encourage folks to just go ahead and have a seat. Uh, grab a last cookie or coffee if you need to. My name is Ian McNeely. I am a professor of history and the department head of German and Scandinavian. Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate Yosha for putting on what's been a very successful conference uh, uh, I'd also like to welcome those of you who have come to us from other states and other programs. It's wonderful uh, to have you here and, and hope you're enjoying Eugene so far. Um, and uh, look forward to the um, uh, dinner afterwards and beer at McMenamin's for those of you who can attend, uh, whether you're from out of state or not. Um, above all, I'd like to thank uh, our distinguished speaker today, Sakura Maria Weineck, who comes to us from the University of Michigan, uh, my alma mater, is PhD institution, I'll add. Um, she is a professor in both comparative literature and Germanic liter uh, languages and literatures. Uh, the interim chair and the translation advisor in Complit there, and the director of graduate st uh, studies and senior honors advisor in the Department of German. So a lot, wearing a lot of administrative hats. Uh, prior to that, she received her doctorate in comparative literature and literary theory at the University of Pennsylvania, her master's degree in German studies at Johns Hopkins University, and her bachelor's equivalent in German studies, Romance Languages and Linguistics at the Westfälische Wilhelms Universität in Münster. She is, by her own self-description, a metaphorologist, which I take to mean a scholar of metaphor. Uh, interested in the relations among philosophy, literature, and um, figuration between the 18th and 20th centuries. Uh, her publications really show an extraordinary range of interdisciplinary interests. Her first book being on the theme of madness in Plato, Hölderlin, and Nietzsche. Uh, two later books showing uh, an abiding fascination with the presence and persistence of antiquity in the modern world. One of these on war, as revealed in the ancient classics. Another on fatherhood and the politics of paternity, explored to the figure of King Laius, uh, which I, embarrassed to admit, I had to look up and remind myself he was Oedipus's father. Um, so very important theme. More recently, uh, she has published two books with Stefan Szymanski, uh, focused on the theme of sports. Uh, one set in the city of Detroit, and another on the debate surrounding the words soccer and football, uh, which is more appropriate in a different situation. Uh, currently, she's thinking about the Stockholm Syndrome. I learned at lunch today she is uh, perhaps also thinking about writing about a campus novel. Um, and this is what brings us down to today's conference, uh, has a work uh, in progress entitled The Irony Monster, Colon, Ungod. And I'm curious to hear, did I, did I, did I get that right? I, th I think today it's Irony's Gods, but uh, the, that works too. That works too. The, the title of her talk today is The right. Gods of Irony. Not, that, so. that was it. Okay, good. Glad I got that right. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, please welcome Silica Maria. Oh, this is, I clip this. Wait a minute. Does this work? Yeah? Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ian, for this was very nice, warm introduction. And um, uh, also, of course, to Yasha for inviting me into to Perry Schoendorf, who had to deal with mountains of paperwork <laughs> because I kept sending her the wrong form back, or I forgot to sign it, or I signed it in the wrong place. And she had a great forbearance. And uh, people who do the paperwork are the, the unsung heroes of um, the Academy and uh, should always be praised. Um, so I'm very glad to be here um, and to introduce you to, to the irony monster, whom I believe to be the last god and also the first. Um, I need to apologize a bit before I start. I, I had hoped to be further along in working out how precisely this monster operates, but um, as you heard from the intro, the university heaped such a mountain of administrative duties upon my bowed head that um, I can bring you not much more than a restructured version of an article I published uh, a while ago. But um, I console myself with the knowledge that the median readership of journal articles is zero. Um, this is a fact. Um, so chances are very good. This will all be new to you. Um, so this project does want to grow up to be a little book at some point in the future. 
Uh, it does not have a real discipline. It's not really literary studies in any responsible way. It's certainly not philosophy. And uh, actual theologians would, I think, uh, frown upon me heavily uh, in the best case scenario. Um, but I've decided to declare a new discipline, just for the irony monster, which I call theogenetics, or the invention of gods. So. I've been thinking about the irony monster and its uh, quasi-theologies for several decades now, uh, specifically since I attended graduate school uh, at Penn in the 90s, so it seems particularly fitting to introduce it at a conference organized and delivered by graduate students, so it's kind of coming home, the irony monster, and I, uh, I think graduate students might be particularly open to conversion, we'll see. Um, but I also need to stress that I cannot be sure that I invented the irony monster, because two of my oldest friends, the, the philosopher Michael McShane and the classicist Daniel McLean, are each quite certain that they did. <laughs> and they passionately contest both my and each other's claim. So the, to the best of my recollection, we, we all did this together, but there was a lot of tequila involved. So, granny students drank like you wouldn't believe. You, you guys, you just, yeah. <laughs> anyway. I'm sure, though, that ever since, ever since we invented or discovered this, it's helped, uh, it's helped me to make sense of the world, or rather of the way I live in the world. And I also know I've convinced a good amount of friends that they too worship and sacrifice to the irony monster. Uh, so, to start. Oh, by the way, I also heard a rumor that you really wanted to have Peter Sloterdijk to open this conference <laughs> or close it. So I, I take particularly uh, particular joy in being here in Peter <laughs> Sloterdijk's stead on Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> so there's uh, this famous anecdote about Niels Bohr, which um, the Zizek readers, of which there are many today, um, you, you already uh, knew this. So um, allegedly a visitor came to, to, to his house, to Niels Bohr's house, and saw that there was a horseshoe over, over the door. And he said, but Mr. Bohr, surely you don't believe in this nonsense. No, he said, but I'm told it works even if you don't believe in it. <laughs> it's a great story. So I think our reading of this anecdote depends on our assumptions regarding Bohr's tone or affect in this encounter. Was he sheepish, for instance? Did he secretly believe there might be something to it, even if he couldn't quite get himself <coughs> to admit it? Did he snap, as Zizek alleges, with I don't know why? Um, or was he toying with his visitor, um, milking the ambiguity, secretly smiling? Was he Pascal, hedging his metaphysical bets? Was he Newton, combining, combining brilliant scientific inquiry with bonkers religious beliefs? Or was he Freud, displaying mystical objects to demonstrate they hold no power over him? Is this a profound story about Bohr, and about physics by extension, and quantum physics in particular? Or is it merely a clever one? Can it teach us anything about um, superstitious matters and uh, the matter of superstition? All cultures are material even or perhaps the most spiritual ones whose very core depends ex negativo on the status of matter. All religions regulate the body and its acts. But when we talk about superstition more narrowly, we usually refer to a process or a system in which matter is arbitrarily and implausibly invested with power. Horseshoes for, for good luck, as the one in Boar's house, black cats for bad luck, mirror, salt, spider, ladders, cracks in the pavement, etc. So now I have a theory about these objects and uh, about our practices surrounding them. And I believe they can be explained by, you guessed it, the irony monster. But before I seek to persuade you, I should first introduce you to this monster. I will do so in a series of theses, um, complete with like brief explanations. I should say I will go on for about 30 minutes because I think usually these things last too long and it's been a very long day and you're all really great for still being here and eyes open and all that. Um, so thesis number one, there is an irony monster. Um, for this thesis, everything hinges on the meaning of is. In what way is the monster? The irony monster is not a bodily entity like a raccoon, say. 
Neither is it a spiritual entity like the god of the Abrahamic traditions. It is rather a contained a narrative entity. The irony monster presides over the construction of a story in which things end badly in a particular manner, and things do not end well in those stories because there is an irony monster. In other words, the monster both produces and is <coughs> produced by these stories as their hidden agency. Kant argued that we should choose to act as if there were a god, even if we do not believe that there is. Similarly, I contend we do act as if there were an irony monster, and because it thus produces material effects, it exists. Two, what are these stories? The irony monster's central task, function, joy, and nourishment is the punishment of certainty, bad faith, and self-aggrandizement of manipulative cleverness. In its purest form, it is at work when the things we do to avert suffering make us suffer all the more, when the things we do to fulfill our desires ensures that our desires are frustrated. Every alchemist who has died from drinking the concoction meant to grant him eternal life is a notch on the irony monster's belt. Historically, this logic has gone by the name of tragic irony to be distinguished from irony as a form of speech. They are, of course, related. Irony always implies a sharp contradiction, right? In ironic speech, the contradiction is implied and simultaneous. Saying a thing while meaning its opposite is what you would find in the dictionary. Um, so this only works if the reader or listener shares assumptions with the writer or the speaker. If, for instance, I were to call the president a well-spoken, elegant, and thoughtful man, you would immediately understand that I was speaking ironically because you have seen and heard the man. <laughs> Tales offered by the irony monster are likewise characterized by contradiction, but this contradiction is temporalized. It unfolds through a narrative process. So one way of saying that is um, irony as a form of speech, the irony belongs to the speaker, um, in the realm of the irony monster, the speaker belongs to the irony. So, three. Nietzsche was the first modern philosopher who appreciated the grisly entertainment the monster provides and who understood its ancient and close association to the divine realm, even though he didn't call it by, by its name. In the <coughs> genealogy of morals, he has this to say about the Jung condition. Quote, let us add immediately that the fact of an animal's soul turned against itself, taking sides against itself, produced something so new, deep, unheard of, enigmatic, contradictory, and full of futurity that the aspect of earth changed in its essence. Indeed, divine spectators were needed to do justice to the spectacle that thus began, and the end of which is not in sight, a spectacle to wondrous, to paradoxical to take place on some ridiculous planet senselessly unobserved. Quote end. Humans, Nietzsche says, are ironically constituted, turned against themselves and caught in perennial contradiction. But in order for the implications of that constitution to appear, they must first become spectacle. Only divine audience could fully appreciate their efforts to extricate themselves from the inextricable predicaments they find themselves in and for that to occur, human life must be thought of and produced as performance. Hence the sense that the irony monster is not just hovering, but watching. It is always at work, but it only becomes visible when the story of its interventions uh, are told and performed in the right way. Hey, Sankita. In that, it resembles for its uncanny. A great deal that is not uncanny in fiction, for it says, would be so if it happened in real life but there are many more means of creating uncanny effects in fiction than there are in real life. I would have meant this here to suggest that the irony monster does in fact preside over what we call real life, but that we need fiction to make us see it. Four, not all contradiction is ironic, not every inversion or every unintended consequence is the work of the irony monster. Likewise, the monster does not intervene whenever the conditions of its appearance are met, though it pounces on the rich and the poor, the important and the unimportant, the brilliant and the stupid alike. Five, the irony monster is best thought of in terms of watchfulness. We all know, and somebody mentioned Althusser earlier, we all know that whenever a cop car appears behind us, we're certain that its driver has been watching us and that we've very likely done something wrong. 
The arena monster has a similar power, but it's always pulled up next to us and it's always listening in. Specifically, it surveys us for acts of bad faith, manipulativeness, excessive certainty. If, let's say, somebody tells you that you will marry your mother and kill your father, your best move is not to leave town, the town where your mother and your father <laughs> live. For if you believed what you were told, it would be pointless to try and avert your fate. It would be equally pointless to run if you did not believe what you were told. So Oedipus should have stayed in Corinth, and had he done so, he would not have married his mother and, mother and killed his father. In other words, either believing the prophecy or not believing the prophecy would have beaten it. Oedipus becomes its victim because he tries to game it, being clever. Hedging your bets in that way is one of the surest ways to compel the monster to pounce. Don't do it. Six. The irony monster frequently masks as fate. It's still very common to hear people talk of fate when they talk about Oedipus. But fate is merely one of the monster's masks. In light of Oedipus's ill-advised attempt to believe his oracle in Ida too, we can see that the irony monster's work may present as fate, but is in fact its opposite. This is in itself a classic ironic substitution, irony to the second power, if you will. It does not just substitute one meaning for another, but the most stable of meanings, prior and fate, for its misinterpreted absence. This is borne out, I believe, by the nonsensical idiom, don't tempt fate. If fate were indeed preordained, it would, by, it would by the definition be beyond temptation. It's not fate if it can be triggered by ill-advised words. Don't tempt fate means don't tempt the irony monster. In other words, don't create the conditions for a reversal of outcome that will be highly entertaining for others to watch, <coughs> but rather less pleasant for you to experience. In the end, I think it is rather remarkable that we would rather believe that there are some people who are marked for disaster as babies than to assume that running into a highly aggressive old man at a crossroads, killing him, and then finding out he was your father is one hell of a coincidence. <laughs> it, appear <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> it appears that randomness is far more frightening than a fate we don't know, but for which we at least are not responsible. In this regard, we worship the irony monster because it subsumes contingency to narrative pleasure. The monster is terrifying, but it provides some kind of closure, though usually for the observers, not the participants. Just ask you, Costa. Seven, closure is not to be confused with new stability. The irony monster is not a dialectic, it is an anti-dialectic. The meaning that emerges when prior meaning is yanked away is not indebted to any primary order, though it may restore narrative equilibrium. Everything happens for a reason. It's not just the most annoying sentence in the English language. It is an offense to the irony monster, which will, if you insist, deliver reasons, but they will not be to your liking. Here's another example of someone a bit too clever for her own good. If you want to escape the irony monster's attention, you should not cross your fingers behind your back. You should not, for instance, say that you will sleep with one of the gods in exchange for a certain knowledge of the future and then not sleep with him, as Cassandra did. If you do this, the irony monster will make your wish come true in the most awful way you never imagined. You will know the truth, but knowing the truth will have lost all purchase. You will, in other words, experience irony, hear the discrepancy between overt and covert meaning in a particularly brutal form when you are the only one who knows what something means. I don't think you should bring this horse into town, you'll say. It's not a gift, trust me, it means something else. Oh no, morons are rolling it through the gate. Eight. The irony monster is the deity of the future perfect, as Cassandra shows. It determines what something will have meant. It is a logic rather than an agent, but it creates an agency effect as powerful as any of the old gods. In fact, as randomicity with a purpose, it is the most fearsome of the cosmic forces. Like the God of the Old Testament, it is all powerful, capricious, it has a distinct cruel streak. We must submit to it because we have no choice. Unlike that God, it is not loving, rarely merciful, frequently entertaining, and has dictated no sacred texts. Though much of the world's finest stories pay homage to it, it has no temples, but we sacrifice to it every day. Nine, the irony monster lurks, though it does not necessarily strike, 
whenever anyone enters a state of unwarranted certainty, which means most certainty, it circles ahead whenever you forget that you cannot control the future and decide to manipulate its conditions. In this regard, irony, or the threat of irony, is part of the price of living in time. You speculate on the futures market, you invest in meaning, you're hoping for dividends, you're wondering how you can insure yourself against irony. <coughs> 10. Superstitious acts are sacrifices to the irony monster. In the Dialectic of Enlightenment, a book that in its entirety right, is, a, is a scream against the irony monster, uh, a furious indictment, Adorno points out that all sacrifices to the gods are strategies to, to manipulate them, to get a good deal without the gods realizing they've been cheated. Quote, all human acts of sacrifice pursued systematically defraud the god for whom they're meant to impute to him the primacy of human names to solve his power. Sacrifices to the irony monster are no exception to this. Making such sacrifices, we ask not for love or reign or victory in war. We ask for stability of meaning. Our rituals, consequently, consist in the voluntary abandonment of meaning, but only when the stakes are low. This brings us back to the horseshoe. Nobody believes, I contend, that you will break your mother's back when you step on a crack. When we hum this little rhyme to ourselves, okay, step on a crack, a few minutes back, um, and skip over the lines in the pavement for a minute or two, we know full well our little dance will not affect our mother's health one way or another. Otherwise, we obviously couldn't stop skipping without being matricidal monsters. Um, we are instead engaging, I think, in a ritual of meaninglessness as an homage to it, because notwithstanding the reassurances of a few thousand years of monotheism, we know that the highest power is not the one that gives meaning, but the one that takes it away. This explains the persistence of superstitions in an age when their original rationales have long disappeared. Like sac sacrificing a cow in the hope of getting many cows, we sacrifice meaning in the hope of preserving it, not because we actually believe that black cats are more ominous than tabbies, or that spinning in a circle seven times will end bad luck spells. In other words, I disagree with Slava Zizek, who suggested in the commentary on that horse show that such practices signal a quasi-ideological displacement of belief into others, onto others, the subject supposed to believe. I think this is wrong. We do not believe that someone else believes that stepping on the crack will break our mother's back or his or her mother's back. Belief is irrelevant to modern superstitious practices. They are, on the contrary, directed at precisely the absence of credibility. Their pointlessness is the point. They are an ironic offering to irony itself. 11. One more way to describe the irony monster's work is to say that, like paranoia, one of its handmaidens, it turns coincidence and contingency into the compelling appearance of significance. It is not a simple loss of meaning, but it's erasure in the service of its opposite, a reversal that does more than throw open the chasm between what we meant to say, or what we meant to happen, and what we actually said, and what actually happened. In order for the irony monster to appear, the reversal must offer a fuller meaning, a greater satisfaction, and the act of reversal itself must matter, and it must be told in the right way. Think of the ring of Polycrates as you may recall or not. Um, so the Polycrates, the king, was stricken with a surfeit of good luck. Absolutely everything kept going right for, for King Polycrates. And the accumulation of undeserved fortune became so worrisome that according to Herodotus, a friend, king of Egypt, wrote him a letter, quote, I like not these great successes of yours, for I know how jealous are the gods. And I do in some sort desire for myself and my friends a mingling of prosperity and mishap a life of well and woe thus checkered rather than unbroken good fortune. For from all I've heard, I know of no man whom continual good fortune did not bring in the end to evil and utter destruction. Heeding this advice, Polycrates throws his favorite ring into the ocean, only to see it return to him in the entrails of a fish he has served for dinner. Oh, oh exactly. Um, to the horror of his friends who hightail it out of town in anticipation of his downfall, which has now ironically become a certainty. So you maybe have read the 
the Schiller version of this, right? Noch keinen sah ich glücklich enden, auf den mit morfreuen Händen die Götter ihre Gaben streuen. So if you order a ham sandwich and you get fish sticks instead, you're in the realm of bad service, not of irony. If, however, the fish you are served contains the ring you threw into the sea so that the gods would not be jealous of you, the irony monster has watched your pathetic attempt to protect yourself through a largely meaningless sacrifice, and it's time for your friends to quickly board the ship. <coughs> your empire is doomed. Okay, so I hope these points have served as some kind of uh, introduction to the irony monster and its various modes of working its havoc. I now want to turn what I promised in uh, the title of this talk, uh, The Gods of Irony or Irony's Gods. It is not just the mythological landscape of Greece that is teeming with the monster's victims, but I believe all metaphysical systems with whose sediments we continue to contend. I think they're all haunted by it, and they all seek to contain its power in different ways. So here are three, three old stories. First one is about Croesus, the king of Lydia, also told by Herodotus. Like Polycrates, he thinks of himself as the luckiest man alive, but unlike Polycrates, this does not worry him. When he learns that the Persians are in sentence, he decides to consult the oracle at Delphi, a cave uh, which is usually occupied by the irony monster. He asks, should he attack Cyrus? Well, says the oracle, if Croesus goes to war, a great empire will fall. And he's like, yay, right? So needless to say, the empire that falls is Lydia, not Persia. The story could have ended with Croesus being burned at the stake. But while the flames begin to flicker, Croesus calls out to Solon because Solon had once told him, count no man happy before his death. And so he calls out, oh, Solon, you are right. Uh, Cyrus hears that and is intrigued and says, okay, put out the flames, bring that, bring that dude here. I want to know what's going on. And the story moves him enough to pardon Croesus and keep him around as an advisor. It's a second kind of ironic reversal. He gets, he gets lucky because he remembered that he should not count himself so. In Greece, the monster often pardons its victims. Even Oedipus gets redeemed at Colonus, up, up to a point. Tricky. All right. Second story is the story of Job. The Bible is not, by and large, an ironic book. I contend, in fact, that monotheism's prime purpose is to contain the irony monster. If Greece's stories concile us with temporality in general and our own finitude in particular, monotheism relentlessly seeks to suspend both, right? Temporality and finitude. Its cartological history is always in the service of its own end. Be it messianic or the second coming, a festival on versions, but not ironic ones. But it's the book of Job that shows us who monotheism's greatest opponent really is. Recall that it's its God, identifies Job as a perfect and an upright man, one that fears God and is choose evil. Sure, Satan says, but he is who he is because of a lack of irony. Quote, have you not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, his substance has increased in the land. Job, in other words, is hedged off by offensive congruence. Good things happen to good men. This is, Satan implies, an atypical state of affairs that can only be understood as an effect of divine intervention. So the irony monster unleashes itself, and now the worst of things will happen to the best of men. I was at ease, but he has broken me asunder. He has also taken me by my neck and shaken me to pieces and set me up for his mark, Job says. His wife dies, his children die. He gets horrible boils, he's in endless pain. Um, <coughs> adding insult to injury, his friends stop by and, shilling for the idea that God is just, insist that he must have done something wrong. Yeah, surely God will not do wickedly, neither will the Almighty pervert judgment, one of them says. The irony monster is only appeased once Job declares not that the divine is good or meaningful or just. He is released only because he concedes that the divine makes no sense. I know that you can do everything, that no thought can be withheld from you in the King James Version, but more clearly in the starker language of the New Living Translation. I know that you can do anything and no one can stop you. You asked who is it that questions my wisdom with such ignorance. It is I, and I was talking about things I knew nothing about, things far too wonderful for me. 
This utter capitulation in the demand for meaning gets him his livestock back and a new wife and new children, whereas his friends, who had argued that God must truly do what he does for good reasons, get chewed out. This God in Job is incensed at the naive endorsement of his plan for goodness. Quote, my wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken with me the thing that is right as my servant Job hath. Again, that wrong thing they have said is that God makes sense, that goodness is rewarded, that wickedness is punished, and furating stuff like that. Job then contains, contains the irony monster, but at tremendous cost. In order to ward off the threat of its mischief and to reestablish order, intelligibility itself must be sacrificed, restored only a hypothetical, hypothetically to an unknowable power that is invulnerable to ironic inversion only because, in the greatest irony of all, it has abandoned meaning altogether. Next one. The most heartbreaking monstrous event, religious event, in my mind, occurs in the New Testament, recounted only in Matthew and Mark. Jesus allows himself to be crucified because he's entirely certain that he's in good hands and that all will be well. All the miracles, the bread and the fish and the walking dead have confirmed to him that he's right to be certain. He can walk on water. He's surely the son of God and beloved by him. And then the ninth hour on the cross arrives and suddenly all the certainty is gone. Eli, Eli, lama zebachtani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I think it's one of the most gut-punching moments in the history of literature. The meaning of his life is erased at the moment where he had staked that very life on it. Uh, ironic timing, scandalously so. And its, its horrifying impact will, will, of course, quickly be negated in the resurrection. But it feels a bit heavy-handed, right? Like, uh, like another deus ex machina. I think it cannot erase the excess of that moment all of a sudden, oh my god. Why have you forsaken me? Right? This was all wrong. That moment, I suggest, is the moment of the irony monster flashing by. Sovereign. In all of these stories, there's a sense of someone or something watching and listening, a terrifying <coughs> form of surveillance, indebted to Nietzsche's intuition that human life can only be redeemed or made bearable when we understand it as spectacle for a force that doesn't give a damn about anything other than the joy of a narrative twist. Ancient Greek stories tend to pay homage to the monster, sacrificing to it extravagantly, guarding against its predation by generally keeping expectations low. Monotheism seeks to deny its power by promising an end to time itself and thus an end to irony. The most ambitious modern attempt to render it powerless is without a doubt Hegelian as well as Marxist dialectics, which subsume irony to imminent teleology. In the end, the twin optimisms of enlightenment and idealism do not fool anybody for long. Kleist is, I believe, the irony monster's first great champion, with Kafka to follow 100 years later. Think of some of the plots. Achilles organizes a show fight only to be torn to bits by Penthesilea. Alcmena learns that worshiping your husband as a god means to forsake his humanity and to betray the mm -hmm. beloved to the idea of love. The lovers of the earthquake of Chile find that the very act of giving thanks for their rescue from certain death gets them murdered more brutally still. The finest contemporary explorations of the irony monsters are to be found in Fargo, I think, the TV series, um, not the film, when each season hapless protagonists <coughs> entangle themselves in ever-tightening nets, largely of their own making, where one clever plan after the other goes wrong and delivers them to the mercy of villains as inscrutable as they are malicious. Have you seen this? Fargo, season three? Best villain ever, right? <laughs> in the end, each of them realizes, as the most terrifying of those villains puts it in season three, that, quote, at some level, food knows it's food. <laughs> this latent sense, the knowledge that we all have at some level, that we are the irony monster's food, drives a peculiar practice, I believe to be very common, and you can either confirm or deny this for me, I certainly observe it myself every time I knock on wood, because someone, or I myself, articulated confidence in a desired outcome. No way this is cancer, knock on wood. 
Um, surely the Democrats got this, right? Bernie got this, knock on wood. Um, they're not going to make me department chair again, <laughs> knock on wood. Um, at least, see, I'm, I'm distressed right now that there's actually no wood in this room from what I can tell. None, none of this actually wood, right? Exactly, so this is worrisome. Um, <laughs> okay, but do I actually believe that knocking on wood will change medical or political or administrative outcomes? Of course not, not even the tiniest little bit. And I also don't believe that anybody else believes this. Nope. And yet, I, I would have to consciously stop myself from knocking on wood in these circumstances, just as, as I cannot celebrate my birthday early. That's a German thing. I think you don't have that in America, right? It's tempting the irony monster um, to, to do that early. Can't do it. Um, it is a fear of, quote, getting ahead of ourselves, another revealing temporal trope that demonstrates how closely the irony monster is linked to the problem of time. When we wait for the actual day of our birthday to celebrate, when we stop ourselves in mid-sentence, just when we're getting ready to gloat about a triumph yet to occur, we fall into the rhetorical habit of causality. Don't decry it, or as King Lear has it, mend your speech a little, lest you may mar your fortunes. But who would be in charge of marring our fortunes in these circumstances? Who, who is listening? Um, so I think there's, there's a need to postulate the listener, right? Um, so we know that should we die before our birthday, it will not have been because we celebrated early, un unless we celebrated in spectacularly stupid ways. Um, <laughs> we know that we will not have not gotten that job because we told a friend it was in the bag. Rational, secular beings that we like to think we are, we know these would be coincidences. And yet, in our imagination, we cannot quite shake the sense that we shouldn't have done that, we shouldn't have said that, that the bad thing happened because we did, because we said. The irony monster is the inverse of the dark shadow of what Freud calls the omnipotence of thoughts and of wishes. Our wishes no longer have the power to make themselves come true, unless we're obsessional erotics in Freud's theory, but they do still have the power to destroy us if we speak them. What is to be done? Rilke, who is a far more ironic poet than he's given credit for, has encapsulated the modern condition vis-à-vis -vis the divine in the duenoelogies. The first one introduces the conundrum, wer, wenn ich schrie, hörte mich denn aus der Engelordnung und gesetzt selbst, es nehme er mich plötzlich ans Herz, verginge von seinem stärkeren Dasein. What well, if I screamed would hear me amongst the angel's orders, and even if one of them suddenly drew me to his heart, I would perish of his greater existence. Metaphysical desire is first of all quite unlikely to be met, right? Who's going to hear you anyway? But even if it were met, having our desire met would kill us. This dilemma gets shortened in the seventh elegy. Glaub nicht, dass ich werbe, Engel, und wirb ich dich auch, du kommst nicht, denn mein Anruf ist immer voll hinweg, wieder so starke Strömung kannst du nicht schreiten. Do not believe that I'm courting Angel, even if I were courting you. You will not come, for my call is always full of striving against a stronger current. You cannot walk. Like much of Rilke's poetry, this passage poses some um, horrifying challenges to translators. Mein Anruf ist immer voller Hinweg is a complex play of propositional prefixes and ambiguities. Anruf implies the appeal to the angel, movement towards him. The hin in Hinweg connotes movement away from the speaker. But Hinweg is not just the way there, it also means be gone, Hinweg, right, Hinweg. It is just the very act of calling the angel that prevents him from coming closer, even on the morphemic level. The very path to fulfillment is also a cry of rejection. The irony monster laughs while any courtship of the metaphysical ensures its own failure. We have to make do without angels. I have nothing on cynicism, thank you. <laughs> Well, we've got lots of time for questions. Um, Who would like to go first? I've got one of my own. Oh, Dan, go ahead. I'll, I'll go first. Um, thank you. That was that was wonderful. Um, I was always curious what was uh, haunting me in my case, and now I finally know. Um, um, I actually thought. Um, these theses were actually, uh, more better articulated and a little bit more helpful than Jeffrey Cullen's on monster theory. So mm -hmm. I thank you for that. Um, I have to use some of these in my teaching. Um, 
one thing that struck me was not all of your examples, but some of them mm -hmm. um, had a close association or a close relationship with enunciation. And I was curious how much of the irony monster is it? Is it that the mon the irony monster? Um, um, Prefers to be closer to speech acts. I think than, so. Than other types yeah, of, uh, I actually was 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 wondering whether to to um, say more about this. I, I think it does. I think it's more of a listener than a watcher. Uh, I think it has a very close relationship to language. That's why also, I mean, the the best Avni Mansa story is always around prophecy and and linguistic ambiguity, right? Um, so do you also find the uh, the the irony monster in in dance or in symphonic music, for example? I. Don't, but I would be completely happy to be persuaded <laughs> otherwise. But, um, because I mean, I, I do think it's a pretty powerful, powerful force. Uh, how would that look like? I'm not sure. I mean, sure, there can be ironic dances, but can the irony monster itself be danced? I, uh, that's what I, I was curious about. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. know. I haven't it, thought about then it. It seems like very much um, coupled with at least the representation of enunciation. Yeah. Um, and, and then I, my other thought was. Mm -hmm. um, um, you have sort of, um, uh, I don't know, maybe deregulated uh, certain notions of, of ritual. And I'm mm -hmm. curious, is there not a type of, does the Arnie monster allow for a type of pleasure um, or meaningful, or maybe meaningless meaningfulness? Um, for example, in, in the rhyme, Step on Your Mother, uh, Step on the Crack Break. Yes, maybe that's not about belief, um, but there is a, a, mm -hmm. a reputation uh, mm -hmm. of, of, of syllables, syllables yeah. and a rhyming. It of course. Yeah. That's, that must be outside of irony. Yes. Doesn't that have a type yeah. of meaning or pleasure in and of Oh, I completely agree. I think, I mean, every single thing um, that convinces me that there's an irony monster can be explained otherwise, right? I mean, if, um, it's actually not a theory of everything. Sure, yes. but, um, and so the, the pleasures of ritual, of, of um, just joining a, a, an ongoing practice that others have practiced before you, right? Yes, yes, um, yes exactly. It's of course its own pleasure, it's right? Own pleasure. And, and has its own rewards. But I'm still, um, but they, they, there could be other ones, right? I just wonder what's, yes, yes. Why are all these um, <laughs> rituals related to luck, bad luck, horrible things happening to you, and so on, right? But it's, it yeah. seems to me that there's something more I mean, that it, is open to it. In your job there. example, I mean, yeah. I can see why theologists may not fancy you much. It's the, <laughs> the act of prayer itself yes. would be um, a, a, a type of worshiping. Of um, course. What, one more question, if you don't mind. I was no. fascinating. I have many questions. Um, what would you? What about the narrative in dreams? Does, does, uh, does the irony monster uh, allow yeah. into our subconscious at all, or is it something on the front level of, of our thought? <clears throat> I mean, I think I'm with Freud there that we actually never know what we dreamt, that we have to, to shape that kind of raw material that bubbles up in these very weird ways when we wake up, right, where we try to get a hold of what it was, and the moment we actually do shape it, it's no longer what it was. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting to me, this is kind of relationship between kind of negative wish fulfillment and the irony monster and, and the Freudian wish fulfillment. Of course, you read Freud, he has to do a lot of work to make something a wish. <laughs> so, it takes, takes a lot of analytic um, fury to get to the wish part. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. You know, I'm sorry I missed the first three axioms. Um, <laughs> I came here for four. Um, I'm just wondering, um, how do you think the irony monster inhabits melodrama? Ah, what a very fine question. Um, hmm, but because melodrama is so often conceived of as the anti-tragedy, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm just thinking back, so I was, <laughs> we were watching a very melodramatic film with Imke and Heidi. Um, about half a year ago, we got into this huge discussion about about melodrama, and so now I'm trying to retrace that in my head. I mean, I think you're much more involved with melodrama than I am. Do you think it's it's a genre that tries to strangle it? That you know that, which would be my first instinct. Yes, but I'm, so I'm not sure because I think I don't have a sufficiently nuanced relationship with melodrama, which has been pointed out to me repeatedly. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, 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 I uh, as, as some of the things you said, obviously made me think immediately of, um, especially that last bit about the temporality of irony, yeah. right? Yeah. Versus the temporality of melodrama, that there might be a fruitful connection there. 
Yeah. Though at first blush it seems like, well, um, but irony also has to happen just in time. Mm -hmm. Completely. Right? Timing is so, everything. Yeah, yes. I agree. So yeah. that's what I was thinking, like, even though Baladrama might seem initially to be anti-ironic right. in that sense because of the reasons that it's not tragedy. Uh, but I was also thinking, like, the, the issue of timing, which we always think about as um, well-meshed between irony and comedy, mm -hmm. is also very central to, um, you know, um, the unfold, just not just the narrative unfolding, but also the kind of en enunciatory positions of melodrama. So, it no, the, it makes sense to me, right? It, it's, it's kind of, it was imitation of life, we're watching imitation of life. And um, so I can easily say how you can give a reading of that film that would allow of an irony monster at work in there. Yeah. Even though it might at first glance, to a naive viewer such as myself, not appear to be the case. So I, I have to think about this more, but thank you for that. Great talk. Thank you. Okay. I, I had two examples. Uh, one, um, uh, uh, following Gant, I was questioning about <coughs> symphonic irony, and I was thinking of uh, mm. uh, Dr. Faustus and ah. uh, Liva Kuhn, who uh, uh, in his sort of in his youth composes a piece called Meeresleuchten, Fast Presence of the Sea, in um, uh, it, which appears to be in the style of Debussy, and and his um, his ambition was to write a piece that showed the demonstrated absolute mastery of that style, while at the same time um, making every listener see that he had nothing but disdain for that style. Ah, sweet. <laughs> and then... Um, That's more like tempting the irony monster, though. I would think that would go wrong. Well, he, 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 he tempted the tempter uh, throughout. Um, and, uh, um, and then, um, just uh, um, in Freud, a, a literal example of gallows humor, um, when he's still, you know, years after his joke book, trying to explain the relationship with the joke to the, to the ego and superego, and, and his... Um, the example is of a man who's being taken to his execution and uh, he, he's being led up the, the stairs of the scaffold and it happens to be Monday. And so he's heard uh, muttering to himself, well, this week's getting off to a good start. <laughs> um, and you know, a variety of interpretations that he tries out. One is this is a, a way of expressing the hope that Monday will not be the last day of the week that he experiences. Uh, but also it, it's sort of the the superego consoling the ego, saying it's, it's going to be okay. Yeah, and it's also the kind of would work well with beyond the pleasure principle, mm -hmm. I think, right? Which we'll develop a bit later. Yeah. You just kind of take mastery over your mm -hmm. demise, right? Mm -hmm. So it's still it's still your death because you're you have the power to make fun of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, thank you for that. Here's hoping. Yeah. All right. <laughs> 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 Some level of food knows it's food. <laughs> yeah. I know you said you didn't have any on cynicism. Mm. But I still want to ask is there any way you think you could bring the irony monster relation to cynicism? Is it another one of its handmaidens? Or? I know, I think cynicism would probably be one of the modes that the irony monster would, um, would pounce on. Mm -hmm. Because it's a kind of cynicism, it's a kind of um, attempt to protect yourself. Yeah. From inversions, right, and um, it's it's a very much that hedging of metaphysical or otherwise ideological bets mm -hmm. that I think is um, this construct I have the irony monsters trying to move you away from. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think Oedipus is kind of cynical when he says, "Oh, I'm not going to sleep with my mother, but <laughs> oh, maybe you better get out of town." And so right, this is something. Okay. I uh, maybe wanted to have you reiterate. Um, oh. You used the example of the book of Job in the Bible, and I'm actually in Professor Calhoun's prepared literature class, so nice. the group that I actually pay attention to work. <laughs> um, the example came to mind Dr. Victor Frankenstein. He reads all these old outweight books, his father goes, Don't do that, bad idea, mm, and then the rest right. of the book ensues. So, is this concept of the irony monster, is this something that you think has been around for like of human history, or is it a yes. Like modern idea? Yes. I, no. I, th I think, I think it, it shifts its focus, and it has different functions. But I think, I mean, there's such a prevalence of stories where something 
backfires, if you want, right, to, to, to put it maybe overly simply, that um, it, I, th I think this, this pleasure we have had at this structure of story seems to be very, very old, which doesn't mean all these stories mean the same thing and do the same work, right, because they still obviously are historically located and so on. I'm not a historian, I'm some of my best friends are. Can I piggyback on that? Please. Um, I'm wondering how a Catholic theologian would, um, uh, now I'm asking you to do that, react to your reading of the New and the Old Testament. Mm. And what's driving this is my suspicion that it, the, the irony monster does disappear for about a thousand years mm -hmm. from the height of Catholic Europe. It's, a, I, it's an interesting question. Yeah. And I, I, I was thinking of the Inferno and mm -hmm. the way in which you know, yeah. it's a catalog right. of ancient um, mythological right. and real characters, each of whom gets literally precisely what they yes. deserve, yes, exactly. down to the exact circle yes. of hell. Yes. There's, and the idea is that if you perform the, the proper ritual, right. not superstition, but yes. the actual ritual, everything will come out right. Mm -hmm. God is not going to, you know, throw you for a loop <laughs> like he did Job or right. even Christ himself. Right. Right. It's all part of one holistic order. Congruence, complete congruence. Yes. Yeah. But there must be cracks in it. There must, I mean, I can't, yeah. I'm sure there must be, but I, I couldn't yeah. come up with the, the perfect example. I'm a, not a medievalist. Um, I, I will put that question to my medievalist friends. Um, I have um, a, a friend of mine, Carla Mallette, works on the emergence of risk in late medieval, early, um, early modern Europe. And this this whole new sense of calculation that she says mm -hmm. only emerges kind of I think end of the fifteenth, early sixteenth century in, in her reading. And that might be one of these moments of reemergence, yeah. right? That well the witchcraft, the superstition, when yeah. all that repressed paganism bubbles back up. Yeah, but also kind of risk and reward and economic thinking yes. where uh, calculation sets in in a whole new way, right? And calculation is, is one of the debates yeah. with, for the irony monster, right? Yeah. Okay. So when we are Jesus, I, um, we find irony as suspicious of any reality behind our imaginations and symbols. And it seems that with the um, term monster, um, you create a new fiction or yes. some kind of reality which Derrida addresses as the specter. Um, <clears throat> and Jesus then distinguishes cynicism mm -hmm. because he says, Cynicism, there is still lurking some hope for some kind of reality. Right, right, right. right. Because so, you wouldn't suffer from the discrepancy otherwise, right? It's kind of an interesting question between yeah. the spectrum as a reality and the fact that we don't have any other reality could be behind these kind of cynicist approaches. Right. Because I think Gizek doesn't think of spectrum as a reality. That seems right to me, yeah. So uh, yeah. that's why that would be another kind of uh, symbolization of the symbol or something, or the fiction. Yeah. Of the fiction. yeah, I mean, I think these kind of, it's, it's, if this does become a book, as, as Ian pointed out, I need to write a murder at the sexual harassment workshop first. Um, but if this does become a, <laughs> sorry, um, a book, I need to differentiate. Um, between these kind of very adjacent categories and concepts, right? And that's got to be a lot of fun to, to figure out how exactly are they different. For instance, Sam, Sam During asked me, is the irony monster machine? And no, it's definitely not a machine. Um, but it's interesting to think about why it's not a machine, right? And how it can be um, even differentiated even from creative machines, right? The trickster in folklore. I'm not a folklorist. I have thought a little bit about German fairy tales, which, of course, to a large extent, are not true folk tales, but but already worked over and and are tales. But it seems to me they are. Um, the folktale structure is much closer to the inferno, where people get exactly what there's, there's a congruence, right? And um, you kind of know what's going to happen. Um, the trickster, on the other hand, would be, I think, 
much more closely related, so I have to think about this, and I would have to read up on it. What's your sense? I don't know. I was just thinking, wow, Coyote in the, the Warner Brothers cartoons. Yeah. About, um, it's a similar energy, right? Yeah. A coyote in the, the right. Northwest. Maybe it would, uh, would help to go back to Skip Gates and the, the signifying monkey and, 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 and those, um, that exploration of tricksterdom. And, and undermining and um, I, yeah, thank you. Think about that. That's that's a great adjacency to explore. <laughs> I have a question in yes. regards to temporality. Uh -huh. um, so you you noted that the irony monster is a creature of the future perfect tense. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm trying to like wrap my head around how. This function. So, is irony, in the sense, something that's always reflective, or is it like happening in the present, and then we have to kind of work with it in some way? I think it's happening in the present, but we will not know that it has happened until it will have happened. Mm -hmm. right. so that yes. makes yeah. That right. Makes sense. Yeah. So, Cassandra is another one, completely a horrifying, heartbreaking story, right? If you think about it, but also really quite funny in some ways. Maybe one or two more questions in the back. Oh, may I just ask a clarifying question? Sure. I'm wondering, um, in the Warner Brothers cartoons, they show Coyote as a monkey, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, it seems to me that the basic structure of irony is inversion, right? Either simultaneously you say the thing but mean its opposite, right? So it's, it's the inversion between overt and, and uh, implied meaning. Or in the, um, the kind of classic idea of tragic irony that um, you do a certain thing to um, get a particular result and you get the exact opposite of that result. Right, so Oedipus leaves town so as not to sleep with his mother and kill his father. And because he leaves town, he actually ends up uh, killing his father and sleeping with his mother. So that's, it's fairly simple. Maybe it sounded more, more no, that's, that's subtle than I meant it. Yeah, pretty straightforward. I mean, inversion is kind of a hobby horse of mine. And ah! It's, it's a, like, in a psychological context. Right. It's totally different. Um, yes. But, I mean, you know, my... Um, what I always bring to inversion, uh, understanding inversion, is that um, inversion is actually the more comfortable model of, in this instance, homosexuality, precisely because it's so predictable. Right, yes. Um, yeah. It's wrong, mm -hmm. but it's totally predictable. It's yeah. exactly what you have in the correct version, just reverse. Right, right, right. Because, so, so yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about, I mean, okay, mm -hmm. you know, temporality, and I think that's one of the most aspects of your talk and maybe even relevant to um, to the question of melodrama, but I'm thinking about mm -hmm. what you were saying about uh, unmeaning and the, the loss of meaning um, and the absence of meaning and how that's kind of the most disturbing thing. And so I'm trying, I'm wondering if there's a fine distinction that you want to make or, uh, or maybe not, but, um, you know, a kind of fine distinction between uh, the exact opposite happening in a sort of predictable way um, right, where uh, the, the inverse of what you expected or hoped or had prayed for, not done wood for, uh, occurs. And that's actually so predictable in a sort of devastating way, perhaps, but in a way that still sort of makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, in, mm -hmm. this, in this way that has a logic to it. Right. So I'm wondering how you square uh, the temporality of inversion and, and um, uh, yeah, I yeah. no, I. I think I mean I think you're completely right. There is something reassuring about it, right? And so I think part of why these stories keep getting told and they're so attractive is precisely because they say, oh, this looks like random contingency, but it's not because the way this narrative is structured there is still some kind of sense and structure to it, right? I mean, there's many, many, many forms of loss of meaning that are completely unironic, right, and have nothing to do with the irony monster. I mean, most, most deaths are not ironic. People die, and it's horrible, and that's, that's it, right? There's no 
the irony. But I think then these stories in which people die in particularly um, entertaining ways, to if that's even a thing that, that might be said, I mean, that give narrative pleasure, right, rather than ethical pleasure, um, is one way to, to shape the terror of that. Right, I think that's just one of the function of narrative as right? I mean, that's obviously not something I've um, I've come up with is, is to um, to structure terror and, and make it manageable, um, just like repetition is in, in Freud, right? Um, Fort Duff. Does that help? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Last question, maybe? Oh, sounds good. Good. Um, so in slapstick, is uh -huh. this a banishment <laughs> of mm -hmm. the irony monster through uh, vision, <laughs> or is you mean banana peel type of slapstick? Well, I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm thinking yeah. of the sort of great sort of Buster Keaton, right, right, right. but so not like, Chaplin because yeah. there's more going yeah, on there. Right? Chaplin yeah. goes through the whole uh, more conflict ringer, really. Yeah. You know, yeah, he yeah, exactly. runs through the machine. Yeah. But uh, in the case of uh, Keaton, is, is yeah. this capturing the irony monster on film at a particularly kind moment? Or, uh... huh. Huh. My sense is it's a different pleasure, but I, I would have to think about how exactly I would work out the difference between them. Um, there's, it's definitely an akin pleasure, right? Um, but I don't think it's quite the same as 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 a. Uh, Tragic pleasure, right? But also, we haven't thought about it enough. I mean, tragic pleasure, you basically have like two and a half thousand years now of theory about why do we like to watch people suffer, right? And I don't think we have the, uh, paid enough attention to why do we like people to watch them slip on a banana peel, which is probably just as interesting a question, but it hasn't <laughs> gained as much um, critical acumen. So, yeah. So I have to think about it. I'm sorry. If I feel I'm disappointing all your questions by saying I have to think about it. Maybe you can take that on. Okay. Yes, the go. sequel. Exactly. Yes. Uh, anything else? Uh, well, let's give uh, Sokabira one more. Uh, <laughs>